Here we go. Hello and welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where in the world you are today. My name is Amanda and I'd like to invite you, welcome you to today's Tech Strong Learning Experience. We are excited and glad to have you join us today for today's program. This is going to be a great roundtable. I've got two great speakers that I will be sitting down and we'll be having a discussion today. Just a few reminders before we get started. Uh, as a reminder, today's session is being recorded. Um, you will receive an on-demand link once we conclude today's live session. We also invite you to join us in the chat. Tell us where you're joining us from, what comments, questions you may have on the matter. We want to engage and chat with you today on this topic. So please do that and you can find the Q&A section to ask your questions there. Um, we also have some great handouts. So check out the um, resources section. Those handouts are yours available to download. Feel free to take those with you on today's topic. And without further ado, let's go ahead and kick off today's topic, predicting business outcomes with enterprise time series data. And today I'm going to do just a quick little introduction from my end, but I'm gonna leave the floor for both of our speakers to introduce themselves to us today. Um, first, first speaker we have is Eddie Farhat. He Farhat, he is an executive director at E and Capital Capital. And then we've got Kamal Alwala, president at Ikigai Labs. I'm so grateful to have both of you here. This is going to be a very interesting but also necessary topic. And would love to have both of you take a moment to kind of introduce yourself a little further for our audience today. So which one, Kamal, do you want to get us started? Yeah. <laughs> so Amanda, thank you for having us uh, on your uh, webinar. So I'm President Ikigai Labs. We are a Gen AI platform for tabular time series data, focuses on enterprises, and in particular, using their tabular time series data to help them with forecasting, predictions, decision intelligence type of use cases. So pretty broad spread opportunity there and uh, excited to actually get into more details in coming time. Eddie? Thank you. Thank you, Aman, for having us today. Uh, thank you, Kamal. So uh, my name is Eddie. I'm from Eant Capital. So Eant Capital is the uh, VC investment arm of Eant Group. Uh, Eant Group is a global technology uh, group starting uh, from a heritage of telecom. We operate in 30 countries, 170 million customers. And uh, basically, Eant Capital is the investment arm of the group. And so Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to have both of you here. I think this is going to be a great conversation. Um, let's go ahead and set the stage today about today's topic. So I'm going to get started here with kind of a lead in and then I definitely want to get Eddie your input and then Kamal. Um, Every organization is experiencing generative AI right now. We know this. It's the hot topic across the tech industry, uh, more specifically large language models. And from what I'm hearing, the results can vary. They can be mixed. Um, Eddie, where are you seeing success in the market? And what does this mean from an investment pr perspective on this? Thank you, Amanda. I think that's that's quite the topic du jour. Um, I think so a few areas where LLMs, I think, now have proven value. Um, you could take on the very complex large implementations, for example, in pharma and R&D, like being able to discover new drug formulations. So that's been, a, that's been a kind of success, which is quite niche, quite capital intensive. We've also you know, seen in the news recently, I think, Klarna kind of uh, cutting 50% of their customer support. So I think the conversational aspect of it, its ability to be to, to kind of respond uh, um, you know, in an efficient way and an effective way has been proven. Again, not all implementations are seeing the same success. I think where things um, uh, are a bit different is when we recognize that a lot of the business information is not necessarily just in the interactions, which are 
you know, in media formats, so whether it's images or text, but there's a lot of it that is good old numbers. And that's, I think, an area where, um, you know, there's been challenges, but where LLMs could potentially help bridge uh, the interaction with the more analytical aspects of organizations. So there it wouldn't be the core, um, ideally, of what powers the numbers, but it could be an interesting way to converse, you know, like conversational BI's next generation could be through an LLM, but then you'd have behind it something that's more robust, much more number oriented. So I think that's kind of, uh, you know, the very wide success, the medium success, and the things that are not really there yet in terms of uh, LLMs. Absolutely, absolutely. So Kamal, I'm gonna come over to you with a slightly slightly different question. Because when we think about it here with large language models, we've also got large graphic models, um, which could be something very new to most of our audience. Can you tell us a little bit more about what they are, how they differ from these large language models that we are familiar with, with like coding, text, writing, and things of that nature? Absolutely. And by the way, I've been, my previous company was in the HR space and we had an AI platform for that. And that was all built on the predecessor to the large language model. So once this thing, the covers came off in 22 December, it's been very exciting. All kinds of stuff is flying around. So let's uh, have a quick high level view of LLMs. Essentially core is foundational models. They are built on and trained on internet scale data. And they're very good with unstructured data and the ability to now create content. And now, of course, multimodal content as Eddie is talking about. And frankly, uh, it's, a lot of it started on the consumer side where being a little off or inaccurate or hallucinations as we call it today was okay, right? So some of those mistakes do happen. And, uh, and but that once you bring that solution to the enterprises is actually not acceptable. So now comes large graphical models. A lot of that actually is a couple of decades of research by our uh, founder and uh, CEO, Professor Devrat Shah at MIT. And essentially the way to look at it is it is a probabilistic representation of your tabular time series data. So now comparing to what LLMs are, the trained on internet scale data, LGM models that we have can be trained just on one enterprise's data. So clearly the relevance is right there because we are not mixing it with all kinds of stuff all over the place, right? So, and the models are built for accuracy and how to measure that. Second part is because it's not having to deal with uh, large language models or internet scale data, we actually don't need GPUs to be effective for a enterprise. So we have this thing about CPUs, not GPUs. And of course, if you won't give us GPUs, we'll take it, but you don't need it. So the cost of operations, the relevance and accuracy, and then the most important part, and I see some of our friends here uh, are from UK, et cetera, is all the AI governance issues about where are you taking my data? Are you mixing it with my competitor stuff? And what does it cost? And what about the hallucination? Who's accountable for that? And what are you, how much of my data are you going to do retain, right? So all the issues around data governance actually don't apply to us. And because of the well-architected model that we have and our ability to help you with forecasting and planning, planning decisions, we can even port it onto others. So not today we're running on AWS and Azure. Down the road can be on other hyperscalers too, or uh, cloud environments. So all of these capabilities that your data stays where it is, nicely protected with all the investments that you've made. And, but now you can actually do more uh, essentially strategic decisions all around numbers. And these are around, you know, these days uh, we're getting a lot of interest around consumption forecasting. Clearly, demand forecasting, sales forecasting with some of the financial services firms around uh, fraud detection, anti-money laundering, uh, predicting the default rate on uh, payday loans. So there are a lot of these use cases, and they're all essentially coming from our models that are purpose-built for time series data. Does that help? 
Yeah, that's helpful. Um, I might have a slight quick question. Uh, with large graphical models, do you, and this is just me personally from working with some LLMs, do you feel that uh, large graphical models might have the potential to produce a better data outset than sometimes we will see with LLMs? Uh, well, they're solved, they're really purpose built for different use cases. Right, right. And uh, and Gartner also had published something in March that basically outlined it very nicely. Yes. That content generation and uh, essentially the experience that Eddie talked about, the chat experience, they're really good at that. And in yeah. our case, we are really good with numbers. And I'm not seeing anyone in the field right now, even the ones that actually are the leading vendors for LLM-based solutions, doing anything on the numbers. So I think where this is going is, in the past 18, 24 months, once the world woke up to AI, what had what we had were settling was that AI is equal to Gen AI is equal to LLMs. And now what everyone is realizing is that that's not the case. There's more to Gen AI than just large language models. Yes. So we need to actually pick the best technology for the best use case. And I think we'll see a mix of these things and there'll be other technologies that will bring in that will have different models. And that's what you'll see. And I think some of the VCs have coined it the model garden. And uh, or and I'll share some of the other stuff also. But that's essentially how we see it, that even we want to use LLMs as a front end. Yes. Not to do your forecasting and decision intelligence. Yeah, I like that. And, and thank then, you. Uh, just kind of chip in also add to what Kamal has, uh, said. I think one of the main benefits of uh, large language models is that they built their worldview from their training data. So you don't really need to give them that huge context to have a conversation, you know, they like can pick that. up what you talk about. I think the implementation of graphical models, actually, there is no pre-existing bias. The moment it's trained on a company's data, uh, that, that company's truth becomes what the model is embedding. And so it's much more true to the use case, you know, the sales use case, the inventory use case, the other use cases I think Kamal spoke of, but it doesn't come in with any preconceived conceptions about what that world model is. And so this is part of, and I think we'll, you know, uh, get into it later or whomever is interested in the yeah. paper. That's what drives also the increase in accuracy uh, for the models. So that's, that's the main difference. Yeah, yeah, and thank you. I I personally wanted a little a little bit more clarity because I think it's interesting. And yes, if if I don't have to write a half of an a pair like three paragraph prompt for something, and it can be done for a use case with data, that's that's fantastic. And that's one of the beauties of Gen AI. It's not just going to be just one thing. So that's wonderful. But let's let, let's move on a little bit because I both of you have covered about time sensitive data. So I want to I want to give our audience a chance to kind of understand that a little bit more in depth. Um, I know Ikigai is focused on generative AI for tabular and time series data. Um, can you explain what time series data is and what's so unique about it from a business perspective? Kamal, I'm going to have you go first for us. <laughs> sure. So uh, one way to understand this is all companies, big or small, run on four time series data sets, your sales, your products, your employees, and your cash, right? Four. Now, of course, you can double click and be more nuanced around this. But for every company, big or small, you are needing to make decisions based on one or two or three or sometimes all four of these to actually make more informed decisions about things going forward. Now, examples are you may be launching a new product or uh, you're getting into a new geography or you've added a new channel partner or you're looking to actually bundle some things together or you're basically have a consumption pricing based uh, go to market. So you're trying to figure out how much of your uh, resources will be consumed by specific customer, et cetera. All of these things are a combination of all these. And so they are, it's all changing all the time, right? So there is this thinking in the past few years that, hey, okay, let me first take 12 months, 18 months to clean up my data. 
and yeah. then I'll apply it to our to my models and then see what I get. Issue with time series is there is more new data every day, every hour. So you can never take a time out of 6, 12, 18 minutes to, for clean data. So that basically raises the bar of what your models need to do, which is the ability to work with incomplete, noisy, sparse data sets. And they are coming in all the time, right? So all these issues around abnormalities and consist, uh, recency and all these things have to be factored in, which our models do. And that's essentially what you need to make your business. And by the way, that is how we are running our businesses. Yeah. Things are changing. The demand is changing. Things are changing in certain market. And if you're global and you have hundreds of thousands of products, it's a very complex problem to solve. So we have want to take you from your orthodoxies of running your business, that this is how we have always done it, to more data-driven uh, and where signals are coming in from all over the place and you are able to actually make an informed decision about how to uh, navigate your business accordingly. That's great. That's great. Eddie, do you have some uh, thoughts on understanding time series day? I'd love to hear what you think. Sure. I think, you know, just to what Kamal said, a lot of the things we do in business have a timestamp. Right? And all the activities our you know employees or our customers or our partners come into that format. And you know, with APIs allowing more companies to integrate, software to integrate. So you also have that kind of uh, data uh, coming in and out from the organization and through its partners. So I think that presents a unique uh, opportunity uh, to be able to process it in a more efficient way, um, taking into account external factor, auxiliary factor, taking into account what the company could potentially be actively doing, like you know the intervention of a marketing team to change a promotion. So how do you take that into account? A change in the macro environment, you know, change of the interest rates or the, the employment numbers. So um, how can we kind of combine all these together to make it more, to have better forecasting for the business? And when you have that better forecasting for a business, there is less waste of time, less waste of resources, you know, and, and better experience for the customers. Um, so I think that's that's where uh, time series data is important in, in how to improve business today. Eddie, there are a couple of questions. Uh, I'll tee them up for you to address when you deem fit. One is uh, from Mike. That's does something like PG vector integrate with the technology being discussed here? And then he had another question that uh, what about influx DB? So whenever you're ready, you can uh, sprinkle some insights on that as well. Great. I think uh, you know I, I'll, I'll I'll have to defer to the to the technical team to see I think in our uh, you know in Ikigai's technical sheets what's uh, supported today. Um, but yeah, please you know please do visit uh, Ikigai Labs to see the latest kind of integration support. Yeah, absolutely, and integrations integrations are great, and that's one thing about a lot of a lot of these. A lot of these tools in the Gen AI space, you know, across that growing platform is um, a lot of those integrations are likely going to change as the models evolve for sure. So integrations they may have today may change in the future. So um, but I I think that was a great question to ask for sure. But yeah, refer to your technical team. And we've got handouts too, Mike, if, if you want to look, kind of go through them. Uh, they're available for download and that for the rest of our audience, please don't forget to download those. They're great resources. Um, let's move on to a little bit more of uh, planning for uncertainty because we've also got, you know, Gen A, I hate to say the term Gen A, I, um, uh, anti-gen AI pe people out there, but they they lean towards the uncertainty with a lot of these gen AI models, large language models, large graphic models, things of that nature. So let's, as let's assume that organizations have been forecasting and planning based on historical time series data that we just discussed um, a few moments ago, and they've been doing this for decades. What new value does AI bring to the table for organizations like such? I think, think about it this way. A lot of our clients, they are now getting past the COVID impact on their businesses. Yeah. 
right? So depending on what you were doing, uh, right. either had a positive impact or a negative impact. But now with a couple of years past COVID, now we don't need to account for the anomalies in our business that were caused by COVID. So we passed that. A lot of businesses are impacted by weather. So especially in the beverage industry, uh, right now as the football season has started, right? So your proximity to college football or NFL, et cetera, has an impact on the pickup in the retail stores. And second aspect there is with the weather changes that are happening, it's not as predictable anymore on when the summer starts, when it ends, when fall begins, and when you're starting to uh, make the adjustment. And just like we were uh, laughing earlier, you kept calling my background a coffee shop, and I kept thinking of myself as being in a bra bar that I came here. Last true. <laughs> so, all of these are some of these are uh, orthodoxies that yeah. this is how you've done it, but uh, they are definitely impacted by external factors. And the second part is, as we are seeing, some of the companies have certain uh, philosophy around how they will invest their money on how much inventory they want to carry. Some want to make sure that if there is a demand, I want to capture every single dollar of the demand. So I would rather err on the side of uh, overstocking and making sure that I capture it versus letting it go. Others say, okay, I only have this much to invest. How do I maximize the revenues I can generate from this much that I can invest for this season, right? And then go with that. And uh, some are in between that they want to be more nimble and some have perishable demand, meaning that if you're a week late in selling the stuff, it's okay because it's not going bad. In other cases, the demand is perishable, which is what we'll run into now, whether it's uh, Halloween, buying season starting around uh, Thanksgiving, although it starts now with Halloween itself, and then the Christmas shopping, when you're shopping for presents, right? So all these are perishable demands that you have to do something and you'll only do it then. So all these are layered on top of the same time series data, and it will vary based on what the company wants to do. Other thing that I'm seeing uh, across a lot of our clients is CFO is very involved in these decisions because a lot of these have very seminal impact on the business. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the forecasting planning FPNA sits with the CFO. So better accuracy, better visibility makes a very profound difference these days because there's so much uh, uncertainty in the economy and the business today. What do you think, Eddie? So, yeah. I think, yeah, this is spot on. But I think to add also more and more of what we do is leaving a digital trace, right? Everything, you know, traffic, uh, shopping behavior, where we go. And uh, those are elements that before were in the unknown for businesses while, while, when they were forecasting and planning uh, you know, to run their business. And so the speed at which data is coming, the variety at which it's coming, um, the, the fact it's so dynamic, trends you know, sometimes used to last years, you know, probably 20. Now a trend could be a weekend hashtag, right? So, so I think that those add, yeah. uh, those <laughs> add tremendous or additional layers of complexity to the job where, you know, I remember uh, in, in, a, in a past life, um, I was talking to, to a CFO and it's like, you know, what do you do? Your planning cycle is like, yeah, we wait, you know, every quarter, so it was like a decade ago. And what was interesting at that same time, a conversation with the CMO is like, yeah, I, I get real time data throughout the day and I need to react immediately. And in a digital world, I was wondering, it's interesting, strategy and planning still sits with a function that thinks in months and quarters, whereas the actual interaction of customers and products is in seconds and minutes. And so how does data kind of help data, which is you know granular in, in, in nature, coming from the interaction with product sales points, et cetera, which usually sits in you know customer support or marketing, but actually that's the, 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 the lifeblood of what actually strategy should be driven by. And so I think platforms that uh, allow to bring that conversation there, make it much more robust and evidence-based, I think will help in driving better decisions for businesses and ultimately for their customers, shareholders. 
Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I, I, I always say this, and this is just me. I, I had a past life myself and worked in retail and uh, retail world for quite a long time. And I always tell people, if you really want to know how a business works on a high scale level, just sit for a day next to one of those like call center forecasters that, I mean, they have to forecast what the flow is down to in the next 30 minutes. And so, yeah, I, I, I love seeing products that can help kind of streamline that for sure. So this is great. Um, and I think it's, yeah, absolutely. I have nothing negative to say whatsoever. I, I, I want to add a quote to that because you mentioned, you know, sitting all time. I think I don't want to misattribute it, but I think it's Jeff Bezos who said it's like, if an analysis contradicts an anecdote, go with the anecdote. As, as, as uh, yeah. I would say... <laughs> Uh, um, counterintuitive it is, is that sometimes in the granular events and interactions, there are dimensions that are not necessarily captured when you start aggregating stuff. And so, yeah. you're, you know, doing a group buy or or, 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 or or a pivot on an Excel sheet sometimes loses a lot of essence. And so you need these models and algorithms that are very sensitive. And that's why I think large graphical models are use useful to sparse. And even if there's one or two instances in the data that are oddity, and if, you know, proven that they're not abnormalities or change points, actually, there is a lot of information there. So is there a new product opportunity there? Is there a, you know, new experience? So I think that's what's interesting in not losing the small data when we deal with big data. I think. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Data can be powerful. We just got to be able to structure it the right way. Um, so speaking with that, let's, let's kind of pivot to bridging the gap between like this business data and between data scientists, because this could be something that it could be a challenging conversation, having your data scientist and then you're having your CFO and trying to explain that use case. Um, let's talk about, about the AI success in this realm. How do you encourage collaboration between the business practitioners and the data scientists to drive greater success, the success and adoption of AI across the business? And this from a security standpoint, especially when I've had to sit there and make a use case for a good security awareness program, I know that this happens in every boardroom. So I'd love to get both of your perspectives. Um, Eddie, let's start with you, especially with the success and adoption of AI within businesses with this. So um, I think you know, one, of, one of the reasons uh, LLM succeeded is that the medium is something we all have, right? Like you, you speak a certain language yeah um, that made it very accessible very intuitive it, it and doesn't necessarily correlate with competence of using it but at least it's accessible i think with numbers we have a different challenge is that uh, in order for someone to be able to interact properly with the data usually there is a lot of you know years of good math statistics a bit of engineering in order for you to be able to interact with it and i think today the opportunity is that uh, uh, platforms that work back from a business outcome, yet pull in all the complexity of data science in, create a joint platform where there is suddenly a language where, while not fully understanding if you want the technicality behind the, the algorithms, a business person can have a conversation with a data scientist like, why do why, why, why are these three time series clubbed together in a cohort? Like, we see patterns of behaviors that are similar between this cake and this cookie. You could bundle them together or you could substitute one for the other. So there is a bit of now understanding what's cohort or clustering of certain time series was what it means actually for the business. And um, uh, on the other side, platforms that remove a lot of the burden today, you could do forecasting with other methods, but you would need to stack up multiple tools together. And that takes a lot of time. You know, in data science, you're going to have a lot of the data scientists or decision scientist time uh, uh, taken up by data engineering, data cleansing, data quality, getting the access. And so having a place where they can actually uh, do the, if you want, the analysis or run the algorithm, but then be able to spend time formulating the business consequences or the planning consequences uh, bridges that gap much better. And, and on the flip side, I think a lot of the executives now, especially in the last you know two years, there's been much more interest in getting educated on what AI is. Uh, there might be an asymmetry today. There is an over-focus on Gen AI, but hopefully that trickles down also interest in, you know, 
all of AI, you know, machine learning, vision learning, and, and numerical data. So I think those are the, the, the having, having a platform and the language to talk, not just about whether the algorithm is running well, but actually what it means in terms of consequence for the business is how things would go, you know, or, or would be best set to, 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 to go forward. Yeah, a couple of things that I'll add to what Eddie shared is this. Uh, you're phrasing it, actually framing it very nicely between the data science and uh, let's say CFO or other line of business owners. The first thing is explainability because both sides want the ability to understand what our model is coming up with and why. So attribution, what is contributing to the forecast, et cetera, are very critical. And it needs to be in, on both sides. The data science team would be looking for, you know, accuracy, variance, attribution, et cetera. On the other side, uh, the CFO is looking for, uh, does this uh, make sense? And can I explain it to my shareholders and the CEO that we, we need to make a decision? So that's number one. Second part is, a lot of investment has now gone into, and I'm seeing this, uh, the spend and the focus shift to hyperscalers. And a lot of our customers now have aggregated their enterprise data on AWS or Azure or uh, GCP, and we already support two of the three. And uh, we can also be deployed inside their uh, VPC. So where they've already invested a lot of time in securing their data and having all the controls and governance around it. So then comes the cost structure that, okay, you're going to actually help me run my business better. So how much does it cost? So that is of high interest to the uh, CFO that, okay, I'll invest in this uh, uh, LGM based technology and, but how much does it cost? And there the value proposition is very strong. The ROI pretty much pays for itself after six, nine months because uh, the difference is there. Then comes that, okay, I've already made a lot of investment either in my hyperscalers or my overall tech stack. How does, do I need a different experience? And what we did was actually invest a lot in our APIs so that the full platform is accessible through APIs. So you can embed our superior forecasting uh, prediction capabilities inside your current workflow, right? So adoption becomes much easier that you can see the impact in three to six months and you're not actually having to build a completely different system. And that has a serious impact on adoption. And uh, because change management, I think will be the bigger issue for all these organizations because you're moving from doing things certain way from everything from Excel to their own proprietary models to actuaries doing certain things of it to now relying on somebody else's model. So explainability, how it fits in, seamlessly and quickly and how to actually have a very clear path to value those are the things that are both sides are actually interested in yeah yeah that is that is very very true that and that i mean i always say you you really got to have a solid use case when you're dealing with a practitioner and leadership is you know they need to work collaboratively and i i i think so for sure that it's it's a it's a two way street conversation. How can we improve the business model? And I I think that's great. I do. <laughs> I think that's great. I am I always am proprietary of we need to have the conversation in a collaborative manner, not in a unproductive manner. So that was that was great. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Eddie, on that one. Um, so now we're going to kind of shift a little bit more as a, a former researcher and practitioner in the security space. I'm sure you get several questions and we've touched on this already a little bit in the beginning on kind of the enterprise security and government governance aspect. And I'd like to di dive into that just a little bit more. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Eddie. What are the top things that corporate boards should be asking their leadership in regard to AI readiness, and I'm going to have you start with us, and then Kamal, I'll let you. So I think uh, you know you, you you both alluded to the some key topics at least I'll, I'll I'll touch on. I think security is you know first and foremost, uh, but also the 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 ethics and the you you know and 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 the governance around the use and the legitimacy of use of 
um, data sets in, in, in different uh, contexts. And so this is from kind of, if you want, this is the, just at least the hygiene part. Before starting, you need to, to have those pillars in place to create a legitimacy to, to go further. I think once those are in place, um, then that leaves room to um, to kind of business and tech to start coming up with use cases and, and, and building on top of them. But as you integrate, you know, if, if an API allows you to seamlessly embed something in a workflow, right, um, the ability to have explainability is the psychological equivalent for it to go into the operating model of the org. You can create something very seamless technologically, but you'll have a resistance point at the decision time because none of this is being implemented without an expert in the loop to begin with, right? Someone's job is at stake for, you know, forecasting going well, right? And so I think having explainability, even if it's in the background, even if they want to spend time, um, you know, a, a period of trust building with the tooling, right? As long as that explainability is there and it's transparent and it's defensible and it doesn't have to always be right, as long as we know when it's right, why, and when it wasn't, why not, right? Um, I think those are the permissions to unlock the value, right? So you have kind of the safety, security, governance permissions, and then you have the business owner's permission to say, okay, no, I'm, I'm going to use this. This is going to really help me um, get better at my job. So I'll, I'll tackle on these three. I don't know, Kamal, if you want to, you know, go beyond that. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I've seen the AI security is one part, but overall now there are more regulations coming out. Uh, in EU now they have a very well-defined EU AI Act, and now they've come with um, now the procedures and how to escalate and how to actually uh, file issues and that get uh, addressed. And California, there's a big debate on and the. California's AI version of this thing is also in front of the governor to sign or not sign. So that's been a raging debate here. And I think the you have to understand where things are going. So it's not just the security part and the investment there, but also the broader regulations that are coming. And the thing there is uh, issues around transparency, confidentiality, purpose limitation, lawfulness, data minimization, accountability, accuracy, data retention, all these will be addressed in some form. The thing for us is, in theory, all of none of us want regulations or anybody else to tell us how to innovate and that let it let it grow, let it blossom, and then we'll deal with it. But the other side is, as a technology provider and AI powered solution, if I have to deal with 50 different states telling me 50 different things to comply with, I can't afford to do that, right? So a little bit of consistency, and it's not just you're pretty much global, like we already have clients in uh, multiple geographies. So that's the thing to sort out that, yes, absolutely security is number one, but also what else needs to be done so that you're complying with the broader things, not just holding my stuff tight, but also how do you actually get it to the customers? And all those things are uh, very, very relevant topics for uh, for the industry now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I, I, I like this topic just because I'm coming back from a uh, security conference over the weekend and I got to sit in on a dear friend's podcast and we were talking about the security and governance, governance aspect. And I think that that was explained very well from both of you, so thank you. Um, I always say security and governance is one thing. And then, of course, we've got the ethics side of everything. And I wanted to kind of touch possibly a little bit on the um, ethical development and the AI ethics uh, surrounding models like this. Uh, I'd love to get your opinion, Kamal, and even you, Eddie, on, on kind of like the ethical side of it, um, for sure. Because the regulations are changing. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, I'll share something very direct. Uh, it's contrarian to Silicon Valley. I can safely assume that everybody on this uh, webinar has good ethics. Three of us on this panel, I think we are very ethical people. But where we land on certain issues mm -hmm. and how we, where we'll invest our time and all that stuff could be all over the place. And I think 
think about it from customer slash consumer standpoint and then work backwards to see what do we need to do to make sure that they are comfortable, right? And that's essentially where things are going. And there are two examples that I'll give you. Uh, 2000, when the Sarbanes-Oxley Act was introduced, we had the same issues that public companies were all over the place and very creative in their financial reporting. And uh, Enron and all these companies were basically wild, wild west. And that was not acceptable for others who are uh, putting their hard earned money on their equities, et cetera. So they had to put this thing in place. And what they did was made the CEO and the CFO accountable that if you're signing on these public disclosures, you are liable and accountable, right? And then those things started to disappear. They disappeared very quickly. Same thing happened with internet and the sales stack. And all of us are come from different states, right? North Carolina, you uh, you were in Illinois. Yep. We didn't know where to apply the sales tax for stuff that was being sold on a browser. And it took some time, but then we figured out how to tax these things. Yeah. So it's the same thing here that I think, we have, and it'll come faster. So it won't be like 10 years from now, we'll figure out how to regulate AI uh, powered solutions. I think it'll happen sooner. Yeah. So I think this thing is we, these are table stakes and we should actually think about it. Would we like it if our personal data was being abused without our knowledge, right? And that's how we should actually layer the accountability and uh, what needs to be done. And that's what they're trying to do. Nobody's perfect, neither the vendors nor the lawmakers, but the intent is there. And the other thing that I do know is all these uh, policy makers are investing in having more smarter people who are aware and uh, very knowledgeable about the latest technologies and where the trends are, who are participating in these decisions. Yeah. Because some of the congressional hearings were a joke. Our lawmakers made a fool of themselves by calling these uh, the CEOs and then not even knowing how to actually understand, ask the question and understand the answer. Right. So all of that is evolving in front of us. I think it's it's a fantastic time to be in the middle of AI. I'm loving it. I'm I you know, I I'm not, Eddie, I'm going to go to you here in just a moment. And I, I I at first I will openly admit this. I was skeptical about AI just because of the simple fact that I came from like compliance GRC world a little bit. And there's so many regulations um, that are in place. And I love that you pointed to the topic that if you had to follow each but state by state, you wouldn't be able to do it. And so uh, many people may not know this from a security standpoint. Illinois actually is a state that doesn't have a data privacy law on the books, like something like uh, the Virginia Data Privacy Act or the California. But there is one that they do have on the books. And surprisingly, thanks to Meta, <laughs> not to call them out, um, but for example, Google, if you use their products for any kind of like cameras or Nest or anything like that, a lot of people don't know this, but um, they incorporate biometrics in 49 out of 50 states and guess which state they do not do it for. And it's Illinois because Meta got sued for it. <laughs> so that's why I tell people that security and governance and ethics can be intertwined, but they are very much different facets. And sometimes they can be same sides of the coin, but they don't always they don't always fully combine in every aspect. So that's why whenever you said that, I was like, oh, yeah, I mean, if we if we did all 50 states and had their own data privacy law, there's a lot of companies that couldn't afford to keep up. So thank you for bringing that to the table because I, I think a lot of people in the business world have the tendency to, um, I don't want to say ignore that, but they may not fully realize that reality for sure. And Eddie, I'm going to pivot over to you a little bit if you want to chime in a little bit here as I well. Think you guys got, got covered some ground. I want to Pivot to the point that actually, like platforms like Ikigai have that in inherently built in. I think when you're dealing with forecasting and, and time series, you're, you're dealing with numbers that are uh, impersonal, anonymized, aggregated, and so also that are intrinsic to the organization. 
And so in terms of, you know, good old data governance, that's the best you can ask for in terms of a data set, uh, because it doesn't pertain to an individual or a subset of individuals. It is fully internal. You know, if you have external data, it's macro data available to all the public. And so I think that's what, what kind of makes one less friction point for adoption. You know, going back to your earlier question on adoption, what are the technical friction points, the management friction points, and, you know, the regulatory and, and, and moral, there is none, I think, on that front, uh, you know, that the platform already caters for from. So I think that's that's one less worry with numbers uh, and, and time series forecasting. I, I saw a question um, in, uh, uh, pop up now on, um, I don't know if you want, Alex, we, we address it now or, or maybe later, but yeah. Please. We can, we've got, we've still got about 15 minutes. Definitely want to give both of you the full 60. If we don't, um, that's okay too. Um, I'm, I'm assuming the question here, how does training processes for LGMs compare to that of LLMs? Uh, let's start with that question. Cause we could, we could dive even further with some of the follow-ups here for sure. I think, uh, yeah, I think here, one of the main interests when we kind of met the Ikigai team and so probably I missed in the beginning, so we, we kind of, we, we invested in, in, in Ikigai uh, close to a year ago. I think one of the interesting points was how efficient and uh, uh, fast is the LGM compared to an LLM in terms of training it for for an organization. We're talking in terms of, you know, hours instead of weeks or months. And second, you know, it's, it's the architecture that is proprietary to Ikigai allows them to um, run these things on CPUs instead of GPUs, which we now you know cost quite a sum um, to kind of kind of train. And so I think those two things allow you when you when you have an, in Europe had the kind of the results that the head to heads done with you know a lot of the models out there, the, the, the Gen AI based models and the more traditional models, I think putting aside the concern for one quality of the answers, the accuracy, the explainability, uh, but also the fact that it's uh, uh, quite efficient and cheap to run. So that's that's yeah. kind of thing to, to keep in mind. Yeah. I'll add something to that. Uh, Chat GPT 4.0, I think, took about 100 million uh, of investment to train the models. Uh, 3.5 took about 35 million. So clearly, as the data sets are growing, the cost is uh, growing even uh, right. faster. That is not affordable for majority of the companies in the world. Yeah, so that leaves the power to exploit the value of the technology in the hands of a few companies. And that is not the right way to bring such a breakthrough technology to everyone. Right. So the democratization will require and that trend, by the way, even Microsoft is already has their own team working on small language models. And the other companies also that are working on that, even OpenAI is working on smaller language models. So that's a very painful issue for everyone that they can't afford to do this implemented at scale. Uh, second thing is the reforecasting and some of these things. In our case, clearly, we want to go end to end within months, a handful of months. The reforecasting for a lot of these large companies that we are chasing uh, and serving is actually in minutes or sometimes even less. So that's why this decision making process can be very, very uh, different going forward. And the last thing I'll share when you're talking about AI ethics, we have actually created an AI ethics council with some of the best minds uh, in the industry and the academia. And uh, Katie, if you don't mind, you can put the link to our page in the chat. So you can look at it uh, as, you know, some really smart people and have been in these meetings. I mean, it's uh, amazing the depth that they bring to thinking through because all of these are uh, essentially been in the AI world for a long time. And uh, they're looking at it from a long-term perspective, not just uh, how do I capitalize on a short-term thing now. Right. Yeah. That's a very, that's a very good point, Kamal. Cause I, I have seen, I've worked in enterprise world, I've done my own thing and I've worked in startup world and the, and I've even worked in mid market. So I've kind of, and I've worked, I've touched a lot of industries. I always say I was cat, cat with nine lives before I got into cybersecurity. <laughs> I found my home there for the most part. Um, but I think a lot of businesses, they look at the bottom dollar with the ROI on it. And I think, 
uh, if there's a way to get more accuracy, especially with the tools that you have um, available, if you can get better accuracy at a more affordable cost, why not go that direction? Yeah. That's at least my stance. Um, we've got a couple more questions here uh, to expand on the one earlier. Uh, that we had touched on, it says, what implementation, the second half of the question said, what implementation, implement, uh, I can't talk today, <laughs> does this have for data requirements and computational resources? Like, what negatives would you say to that? What what kind of challenges do you think that the the LGMs could have in comparison to the LLMs, possibly? If, if we already touched on that, we can move on to the next one. <laughs> I think the main thing here is, and Eddie has uh, actually taught me a fair bit along with our Professor Shah is, it's the, our ability to do the imputation. When you don't have enough data for a particular use case, we can, through imputation process, actually make up for that lack of enough data so that you are not just uh, shooting in the dark, you're making a well-informed decision. So. Now, what we like to say is uh, how much data is needed? I think enough so that it could be four quarters, it could be eight quarters. So going back enough time over an enough period that all the different events have been covered, your seasonality, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you've seen most of those things in your business. And once that you have reached that, you don't need to actually put in more because you're just adding stuff that doesn't quite add value. And the, one of the innovations that we did was uh, what we have released recently is time to work, right? So word to work was a breakthrough about a dozen years ago by Google. And that's what has teed up the ability to take the, the words and the text and the content into vectors. So now you can do mathematical equations on apply that on top of that. We have applied the same to time series data, right? And being very efficient with it. So it's both innovation, without actually adding to your cost of bringing it into your enterprise. Both of those are being addressed. I like that. Eddie, do you have anything you want to share? <laughs> I think I, I had already covered, I would say, the first part. Okay. We, can, we can move on to the next question. Yeah. Absolutely. Think, there was another question uh, from Rosemary, the uh, yeah. that is it better? And I think our question was if I, and, Rosemary, you can correct me if I'm rephrasing it incorrectly. Is it better to build on an existing tech stack or build your own tech stack? Yeah, that's a burning question too, because I mean, especially if you got to have leadership buy-in, <laughs> the, the question is always, how much is this going to cost me, right? <laughs> what do you think, Eddie? So I think, you know, it depends on context. That question has so many answers. I think when it comes to um, time series forecasting, you know, we're trying to go for more simplicity in the, in the work, yet not to lose any of the signal. And so being able to use time series forecasting platforms that will take care of the data engineering of getting the data, the imputation and the cleaning, of having the models of choice hosted deployable to production. You don't have to manage your own CI, CD. So I think being able to move a lot of the ancillary work around forecasting and being able to immediately as a, you know, as, as a data scientist, being able to produce results to directly talk business and free you up to do so. It's, I think that's, that's the, 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 the option of choice or that's, that's the way to go forward. And again, affordability plays a role because taken probably independently, each of those other items might look cheaper, but when you look at the complexity management, the data science team ends up having to do, it's way more pricier and it's it's a technical debt for the organization. And again, I might have a different answers if you're talking to me about, you know, do I build my own cloud? No, but, but I think specifically for time series forecasting, I think the way to go is with a reliable, deployable, explainable tool that allow you to kind of get to results rather quickly. Yeah. Good point. Good points. Um, we got another question. This will be the last one that we'll take in the Q&A and then we'll start wrapping up uh, just to be respectful for both of your time and our audience as well. Um, 
And this is actually one that I was going to bring up. So thank you. <laughs> what are some of the more compelling applications of LGMs that you have encountered in your work? So, for example, are there specific, specific industries that you've worked with that you have seen far more progress working with your tools, especially with an LGM model, than others? And I'd love to hear about them from both of you. Kamal, do you want to get started? Sure. So uh, I'll give you a uh, quick thing. One was uh, last year, exactly about 12 months ago, we were focusing more on our low code, no code building environment. And, but then we realized that it was taking a little longer to explain why we were different and better while our strengths were in our models, which was about forecasting and planning. So then we narrowed down the focus to time series forecasting, tabular time series forecasting. And now then it took some time and uh, then our marketing team got going. And now suddenly we are working with some of the largest companies in the world who actually have centers of excellence around time series data. And internally we would have these discussions that, hey, there is no VP of time series data, but turns out there are. And uh, so it's one of those things where none of these things are uh, as obvious, but now what's resonating is a lot of the companies are essentially living on that, whether it's financial services, whether it's uh, oil and gas, whether it's uh, technology based or uh, manufacturing. And also there are new pricing models that are dictating the need to do the forecasting and planning better. And uh, I gave you an example of that. One is consumption based um, pricing models, because then you need to know what the consumption is and what it's going to be. And the other one is, uh, especially around financial services. Yeah. All of that around whether it's money laundering, fraud detection, forecasting the default on your loans, uh, the cohort of stocks that are behaving similarly, all of them, like, there are so many use cases. So I think it's an exciting time. Uh, and why, Eddie, what do you think? So I, <laughs> I, I, I like that you started, I think, from anecdotes where, you know, I think, the business is getting interest um, and work um, from from the industries you mentioned. And I want to take take it a slightly different uh, look at it. Is uh, you know the saying the, the quality of your life, the quality of your decisions kind of dictate the quality of your life, and, and that's you know very true for businesses. If your life is moving slow, you have two or three levers and can take your time to make decisions. You don't need time series forecasting. If you have you know 200 dimensions to account for uh you need to make decisions very quickly and you have a high variety uh, in the nature of of work right and so those are the things where i think that's why it's coming from those industries which have sometimes very sparse data that the, you know the the prediction will change based on the month of the year and so you need to be able to to account for that where, where they have a lot of complexity global multi-product i think that's that's kind of how it it's 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 ending up and it's showing up in the you know kind of the pipeline of the business the the, the customers um, the team is talking to etc. One thing that I'll share that uh, we do well but it's now resonating extremely well is reconciliation. Right? Yeah. The way we work, it's yes, you have your time series, but then you have hundreds of thousands of products that are being sold through multiple channels. So you're looking at a multi-dimensional matrix and the changes are happening at various places in various, uh, uh, whether it's channels or uh, your product, some product is doing well, some is not, all that stuff. So accuracy comes if you're able to reconcile all the signals to come up with a consolidated forecast quickly. So our ability to do all that reconciliation is very appreciated by global companies. And that we were, we knew we were good at it, but now it's really starting to resonate well. So I think some of this is just a, uh, evolving very quickly in front of our eyes. Eddie, you were going to add something? I think you, you just touched on a point and I wonder, I'd like to finish this. Uh, every other forecasting method looks at locally what that data is and you know what the sales will forecast, marketing forecast. I think one interesting thing with LGMs that is akin to LLMs in a way is that once it's trained on your company's data, it's kind of, in a way, 
a, a digital twin of that data. And so even if different parties will ask a question, there will be to some extent or to a very good extent internally coherent. So if I'm trained on all your data and marketing is asking a question and then sales ask the question and finance, those will reconcile with what the large graphical model has in, inferred about your business. And that's a big, big plus than having three different tools, a marketing forecasting tool, a financial forecasting tool. So, and that's that's usually a nightmare for finance teams to, to reconcile all that. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. All right. Well, we are about at time. Um, do we want to do any rapid fire insights or anything like last minute, a couple of statements, a couple of sentences you want to share about this topic um, for the audience? And then we'll go ahead and close out the session. I'll make a broader uh, public <laughs> service announcement. Public service announcement. I love those. <laughs> Everybody's worried about how AI will take away the jobs. And I like to frame it in terms of a third, a third, a third. A third of the jobs in the current workforce will get eliminated because of automation and because it's simply not needed because uh, AI's powered solutions have taken care of it. The middle third are where what we do today will change dramatically because AI can change a lot of the things that are happening. And the last third will be the net new jobs that will emerge. Things like prompt yes. engineering. There was no such thing two years ago. Yeah. And most of the time, all of us get excited about the last third and largely ignore the first third. But I think all this will unfold in front of us in the next three to five years, not in 10 years. And yeah. all of us will be impacted. Uh, individual contributors and CEOs running their businesses. So I think we should be leaning into this thing to figure out how we want to navigate the AI wave. And, uh, but I firmly believe uh, this thing is now at full steam now in front of us. I agree. Eddie, you're welcome to share if you'd like, or if you don't have anything additional, yeah, you're I, fine. I, I just wanted to thank you, Amanda. And Kamala, yeah, and yeah, absolutely. My only final thought, Kamal, what you touched on was something that I actually say very, I say it a lot. I. When I was in college, I worked at a grocery store and we implemented self checkouts. And I saw the live deployment of self checkouts back in 2006. It still took up until COVID for them to double down on that. So that's why it's like some technology I think is going to be a lot quicker to implement and deploy than others. And I think definitely the AI and the LLM and the LGM models are going to be the spearhead of, of that moving forward. So this was a fantastic topic to cover on. And I thank both of you for joining us today, for sure. Um, we are a little over time, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Just a few quick reminders before we let you go. Today's session has been recorded. We will send you a link at the end uh, after we conclude the live session to view this and um, we also have our survey. You can find that in the resources section. Please take this survey. This was a great topic. We would love to know if this resonated for all of you. We'd love to have this group back here. Ikigai Labs, we'd love to have you back. I love the name. I love the name. I have to say that because I know what it means. I had to be reminded because I had to look it up again. I was like, I thought that's what it meant. But yes, I, I love the name of it. Um, I think this is a great topic. I think AI is AI is becoming, we need to learn to understand it, not run from it for sure. So thank you both to Kamal and Eddie for joining us today. And with that being said, this has been another Tech Strong Learning Experience. And thank you all of you for joining us today. Have thank a great you. day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.